Thank you. So um, as I said earlier, I'm in, uh, in these comments, I'm going to talk first a little bit about Oncotype DX in the present, some new data, some uh, a couple of the more advanced topics, and then turn to the future, some of the new and exciting things that we're doing in terms of new technologies with next generation sequencing. Uh, this is also, I know, something that uh, has been pioneered by some of the research groups here in Israel as well. And I know there's great excitement in the research community here, and I am really excited also too. Uh, in terms of uh, genomics, as I said earlier, there are still some other countries that have not seen that it would be important yet to make sure that Oncotype DX testing was used for their patients. In fact, they use almost no molecular tests, uh, for example, in some countries. But clearly, Israel had the foresight um, to see that this was going to be important. And it is now clear I get to go to Washington now sometimes. That is an interesting experience talking to the politicians there. Uh, they are, um, you know, uh, you know, not, not doing their job in the United States, because what we need to do is we need to address the issue of healthcare spending. We are wasting so much in terms of the money that we spend in the United States. We spend more money in the United States probably than anywhere in the world. And it, for the most part, for many diseases, our outcomes are no better and sometimes worse. You know, that's not good. Uh, we need to be account. We are accountable for that, and need to to do do better. The number I sometimes use is that in oncology, uh, some reports say that on average the response rates to treatment are about 20 percent. Maybe um, we spend 80 billion dollars worldwide on cancer drugs. If the response rates are 20 percent, it means that we're wasting 60 billion dollars a year worldwide by using drugs that aren't targeted or aren't given to the right patients. I believe that every drug is ultimately targeted. It's just for most of them, we haven't figured out um, the biology or, or the host factors that we need to understand in order to target them. Uh, healthcare reform is very important. Technology is accelerating. And in the United States and in other countries, there is a great fear that that the introduction of new technologies are just going to uh, be used by physician to add to the costs and not improve uh, health outcomes. And so clearly, we believe, and I think many of you also share the concept or the idea that this idea of, of, of using genomics to do personalized medicine, or per, some people call it precision medicine, that that is going to be one of the solutions to many of these problems, not the only one, and really help to make a difference in our patients to do the right thing, to give the right patient the right drug at the right time. Um, we have been doing this, as you now know, uh, not only in invasive breast cancer and in DCIS, but also now in stage two and three colon cancer, as well as in prostate cancer, our most recent test. So uh, maybe just to ask if you could raise your hands, how many of you have used the colon cancer test in either stage two or stage three disease? So a couple here. And again, the decision for what purpose is that used, um, again, it's used in conjunction with MMR and T stage, because those are also important, to look at the question, when might surgery alone be, uh, be appropriate or when one might add chemotherapy and to have that be more objective and based on uh, you know, genomic information. And that's now, uh, there are now three independent validation studies that are all very large that show the value in terms of predicting recurrence risk, do I have aggressive disease in stage two and now in stage three colon cancer. Um, any questions about the colon test? Maybe I'll stop there for a second to see whether um, our, we, our service in that case, we do good pathology. We're doing everything right with the same kind of quality that we brought when we did the breast cancer test as well. Good. Uh, prostate cancer is our newest test. It, we just made it available um, 
in May of this year, and actually we're, there's a prostate meeting in northern Israel right, uh, right now. Uh, we are uh, talking uh, with Lior with uh, the payers here in order to be able to move to getting reimbursement, how we're, how, you know, which is going to be very important for the prostate test. But briefly, for that test, again, we always want to try to answer the most important question. And certainly in the United States, which has a lot of PSA screening, and I think in Israel probably as well, also a lot of PSA screening. We have succeeded in the last three decades uh, and have been very successful in tripling the number of prostate cancers that we diagnose. But how, if we've looked at the population data and at the controlled studies, uh, when we offered more than 90 to 95 percent of them aggressive prostatectomy or radiation, uh, how much benefit have we seen in terms of survival? No. And it's not that there aren't some patients who have aggressive disease. It's just we knew 30 years ago from autopsy studies, right, that if we did autopsies on men who died in their 50s from uh, other causes, what percentage of them would have prostate cancer incidentally? It was really high. I think it was above 50 to 60 percent. Um, yes, that high. And so it says that prostate cancer is most of the time not very smart. Most of the time, prostate cancer, fortunately, is very dumb. It knows how to grow a little bit in the prostate. And we know that there are circulating tumor cells, so we know that those cells for many years can get out into the blood and can go to the bone marrow, liver, lung, and everywhere else. But they are so dumb, most of those prostate cancers, right, that they do not know how to grow in the bone and survive in that hostile place. And therefore, that biology is a favorable biology. And most of those men will, will they die of prostate cancer or die of something else? They're gonna die of something else. So what we chose to do is to focus on the most favorable group of men. These were men, and it's more than 50% of all prostate cancer, who have either Gleason 6, that's a 3 plus 3, or Gleason 3 plus 4 with very low volume disease, maybe only one little core positive. And we know in those men the rate, based on those favorable features of breasts of I always say this now, of prostate cancer progression or death is less than 2%, meaning they're 24, 20 fold more likely to die of some other cancer they don't even know about. And yet, because of the urologist, the way the conversation occurs, because of fear of cancer, you know, because of the fear of the kind of prostate cancer that existed before we did screening, almost everybody chooses aggressive treatment with incontinence and, um, and uh, impotence and other problems instead of taking an active management prog program of active surveillance is what it's called in the United States. So actually that's what our test for is for. There is a score. It is again a continuous score and it helps when it's done on the biopsy to tell men that even if they had a prostatectomy the grade would stay low and the disease would be organ confined. Because one of the reasons that men choose to have the prostatectomy is that they're afraid because prostate cancer is multifocal that we might have left behind some aggressive disease. And so that's what we did with that study. I don't know, has, have, have you had a chance at all yet? Do any of you see prostate cancer or treat prostate cancer or just something we all hear about and we all know someone? who struggles very much with this. And I think that's why you know, it, it's going to be so important here in Israel as well. And so uh, stay tuned on that. I think there's going to be, um, you know, you know with, with reimbursement, we're going to have then make, make much progress, here, I think, here. We also have to address that the urologists sometimes have an incentive um, you know, to, to do procedures. And there, the payers can also um, you know, provide some incentives to make sure the right thing is done. Um, the, the, the payers all over the world now are getting more active and providing incentives and providing their opinions. I don't know whether you saw this, but in September, just 
five or six months ago, uh, NICE came out of their, with their very thorough review of all the genomic tests. So they looked at Oncotype and then all of those other tests that are out there as well. NICE, as you know, is often not very nice. Um, but in this case, I can tell you we are very pleased, and I know the physicians and the patients in the UK are very pleased because uh, NICE did come out with a recommendation uh, that because of the predictive value of the Oncotype DX test, because of the level of evidence, that it and only it uh, is the test that they recommend for reimbursement in the United Kingdom. And so that's going to have an effect not only in the United Kingdom, but we believe uh, other countries in Europe. Actually, I think it was Dr. Noah was just at a meeting in Rome a month ago. There were physicians there from 29 different countries, and she talked there, right? Uh, and some others were here. Anyone from here there as well? Oh, yeah, that's right. You were there as well. So it was really great, wasn't it, for Israel to share its experience with some of those countries where they're still only at the beginning in thinking about genomic tests. And they asked all those questions that, that, that you all asked back in 2004 when this was just coming out. So again, thank you for you know, sharing that data and publishing that data and making it available to other countries. It really makes a difference. Um, the, the other thing I'm going to just say briefly, we talked earlier about the DCIS score, so I'm not going to say more about that. I also will mention we do have data now um, in metastatic disease. It was presented by a surgeon from Memorial, Dr. King, at ASCO uh, again last year. And I'm going to just turn to that for a second. I just want to say this is not a result that means that we should be sending cases to make a decision in stage four disease. Um, stage four disease, I guess, de novo, at the time of first diagnosis, I just heard last night uh, occurs in the most recent registry data in Israel, 3% of cases. So actually, that's very low. I think that's low than other countries around the world. Um, but what Dr. King was interested in thinking about and this is just looking at the biology question, is the biology of the recurrent score still important in terms of high re score, recurrent score being associated with more aggressive disease, low recurrent score being associated with less aggressive disease, even in those patients who present with de novo stage four disease? The answer is yes. Now, that result doesn't change clinical practice in terms of local therapy yet. Um, and again, those studies are still uncertain as to whether or not we should change the guideline right now, which is to uh, treat with systemic therapy in that case. Uh, but those studies, again, are continuing. Okay? But it does certainly, again, highlight biology matters, you know, whether we're looking at the biology is a very, uh, of oncotype is an underlying biology that expresses itself early and is important throughout the course of breast cancer. KI-67. So um, there now is a conclusion now from many publications. I just highlighted two of the, the biggest ones uh, that came out in the Journal of Clinical Oncology that looked at the issue of reproducibility, uh, that looked at the issue of should KI-67 be in guidelines. And the conclusion was at present the enormous variation in practice markedly limits the value of KI-67 for any of these contexts for treatment decision making. And actually what they did, uh, and I applaud uh, these pathologists for their transparency and their honesty and their willingness to volunteer for such a study, but six of the best KI-67 labs in the world, Dr. Dowsett, Dr. Viali, Dr. Pinel yorka uh, Dr. Nielsen, Dr. Gown, Dr. Fraser Simmons. I mean, these are these are really good pathology groups. All said, we're going to look and explore uh, our assay technology and see whether we get the same results or different results. They actually did a study very similar to what I did with Herceptin and the Hercept test in 1997, because when we went to the FDA with Hercept test data. We actually had to send the same slides to a couple of different laboratories 
to see whether they got the same results or not. And one of the reasons I started with at genomic health was I saw how terrible those results were, you know, how difficult it was to get quality IHC, you know, in different labs. So what did they do? They did the same thing we did. They, take, they took the same cases, and the first thing they did is we're going to send it to these eight labs, and you'll stain them locally, and then with your eyeballs, read them locally. And this is what they found on the left. So these were locally stained and locally scored by, again, expert readers. And what's shown there are box plots of the range of KI-67 in each of the labs. And notice the variability in each lab was different. Some labs varied more than others in terms of the range of KI-67 results. But the most interesting thing, what is the cutoff that is used um, in, in, in our labs here in Israel? It varies, right? I hear sometimes, what, 14 percent, sometimes 20 percent, right? But if one looks, what? Yes? No, yeah. But if one looks, let's say the cutoff is 20 percent. If one looked at the lab at the far left, every single case, right, would be low risk. If we look at the lab on the right, every single case would be high risk. And it was interesting, they did the next logical thing. This is the same thing we did with the Hercept test. They said, let's look to see what, is this all variation of staining, or is this variation of reading, or both? So then what they did is they took slides that were centrally stained and sent them to the same labs. And all the labs had to do was to read them. And you can see there's a little less variation. So some of the variation clearly does come from the staining, but a lot of it, yeah, a lot of it comes from the reading. And, and what was explained to me, there are two things to understand here, why this problem will be very difficult to solve. One is that antibodies stain three-dimensional structures of protein. And when formalin is used to fix tissue, formalin denatures proteins and changes their shape and can create false positives and false negatives because it changes the shape of proteins. And so that is one of the reasons. And that is why also the staining looks so patchy and heterogeneous. The other reason and why the reading is so difficult is it is very difficult to pick what area to read. And probably, maybe in some labs, they do some selectivity and say, let us pick an area that looks like it has a lot of stain. And if you read in that area, you're going to have higher scores. Whereas some people might pick on the same slide another area. And so I do not believe that these problems, they are going to continue to try to improve this. They clearly do not recommend that it should be used based on this. But I, I, am, I would be quite pessimistic that those two problems are going to be solved. And by the way, we've looked and have published the recurrence score or our mRNA for KI67, and there is a very high discordance rate of the recurrent score and uh, KI-67, yeah. In, 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 other, in other words, what, what was recommended that the, even if the PATH lab is doing KI-67, it shouldn't be in the report. No, it, sh it should it be only for future studies, yeah. but not in the report for the clinician. Yes. Hmm. What's concerning other diseases? Other, other cancers, like uh, colon cancer, uh, brain cancer. I know that, uh, especially in glioblastoma, uh, KI-67 has a very high uh, effect on this, our decision to treat patients. Yes. And so what I would recommend for other cancers is the same kind of study like this be done. And if the evidence is that I am not, um, uh, I want to be very clear, uh, in s I am always saying uh, we should use the technology that works and that's reproducible and, 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 and meets our standards. 
And just because it's fancy uh, doesn't mean that it's necessarily better. The MMR assay for colon is an excellent IHC assay. It is reproducible. And because there's the internal control of normal colon tissue, it is much easier to determine whether there's an artifact or not. For this KI-67, there is no internal control for the IHC pathologists. I, I am not aware myself of the literature in, in brain cancer, and so I would say, though, um, one should look at you know, how reliable it is and how reproducible it is, and maybe, it, maybe some of these problems are less of a problem in brain cancer. Now, the other thing that I talked earlier about is about the intermediate score, and I highlighted that, that, the, that, that you, uh, you, you did such a nice job with that recurrent score of 26 in looking at the other factors and seeing how, um, you know, th what, what the other factors were. Um, this is a small registry uh, uh, analysis that we presented just in the last year. It's a little less than 200 patients in the United States. But we were able to look at the experience in the United States in that cohort of using chemotherapy as a function of the recurrence score. And as you can see in yellow, that's the percentage of patients who were given chemotherapy. And again, with a score of 18, it was about 29%. You can see almost a, a continuous relationship, though. As the recurrence score went up, the the rate of chemotherapy use went up. And so I, I think this is a, you know, probably, again, a, a good example of that integration of not relying just on this as a group, that all intermediates are the same, but in thinking about them individually. And I said it, it would be, re, be very interesting in the large Israeli cohorts, which are much bigger than this, it would be very interesting to, to look at the way that chemotherapy is used in the intermediate group here in Israel as well. Okay? Now, the, the, uh, the thing that I'm very excited about, and I could talk about this for hours, and I had to therefore choose just, just one or two stories about next generation sequencing, uh, how I think about it, what we're doing, what we can look for in the future. And I clearly am not going to be able to talk about everything. But the first thing I'll, I'll start with, I will say, these machines that we now have in our laboratories, and we've been working on next generation sequencing in our labs now for two and a half years. All of our research studies are now being done using uh, either the ion torrent machine or the Illumina machine. And we have both of them in-house. Um, I, I never could have dreamed that uh, we would be uh, able to uh, get uh, so much genomic information uh, so quickly uh, at such a, at, at, again, so at such a low cost. When I did the work at Genentech to clone uh, human DNA one the gene for Pulmozyme, I worked with the DNA sequencing lab. It was one of the best DNA sequencing labs in the world at Genentech. And when we sequenced the DNA gene, we ran, what, 500 or 1,000 base pair fragments into a gel. Remember pouring gels one, one at a time, those lanes, you know, putting them with the electricity, trying not to get, electric, you know, trying not to get electrocuted. Um, and you would maybe get, you know, be able to sequence 30 fragments in a day. Well, in our genomic health laboratory and in laboratories now, because these boxes are, you know, are now, you know, available and can be purchased, um, we can get in six or seven days 50 million fragments sequenced. Think about that. From 30 lanes to 50 million. I never would have dreamed that. And so now what we're doing, um, and you've read about a lot of work, and Israel is doing a lot of very nice work looking at mutation analysis, looking at the sequence of DNA. We are also now, by doing the 50 million reads, we are counting, therefore, the expression of every gene in the whole genome. Instead of doing just 21 genes, we can look at the expression of all 23,000 genes, as well as intergenic regions and introns. It really is amazing. So I'll talk a little bit about it. It has clearly opened up the lens. 
The first thing I want to say, though, is that as amazing as that technology is, um, I talked earlier about um, uh, you know, that good science and good medicine is not going to go away just because we have fancy new technology. And that is going to be so true. With NGS, with these new technologies, we still have to focus with a clinical perspective on what information matters and how do I use it and who's the right patient to test and what do I look at and how do I interpret it. That will continue to be key to practicing good genomic medicine. The other thing will be standardization. Just because you have a box and run it doesn't mean that you're going to get a reliable result. Denny Slayman fought for 10 years to convince people that HER2 was important. And I remember he was so angry because he said everybody would maybe set up and run their own HER2 assay in their own lab because assays know how to set up, you know, labs know how to set up assays, and then get different results. And there would be these you know, false controversies. Imagine if when we developed Herceptin, we said that it was OK for each site to manufacture the Herceptin in its own hospital or in its own university. We would never do a good job of drug development. And so it's really important. Assays you know, can be done locally, but again, uh, we know not all uh, assays are the same and methods really matter. And that's going to be true for next-gen sequencing and the new technologies of the future. And then reimbursement and making sure we're, we're not just paying for information that doesn't change treatment decision making or it could be misleading in terms of outcome. Uh, that obviously is not what we want for, this, for these new technologies. And clearly, I'm going to come back to it, the science now is now big science. There is no such thing as little experiments anymore. At Genomic Health, we used to have a team that had maybe 15 people in the lab and maybe one or two people doing the data management, the analysis, the biostatistics. Now we have one or two people in the lab and 17 people doing the, the, you know, the informatics, storing the data and looking at it because the amount of data is so large. And actually, I want to say Israel has provided for us a lot of the security technology and other cutting edge IT technologies that allow us to do this. So, you know, again, tremendous. It's required teamwork not only with, uh, you know, bioinformatics, but also teamwork with people to buy the servers and store the data and do all that. What we now know is that um, what we had hoped for, that breast cancer would be very simple. Um, the short answer is it's not so simple, and it's going to be hard work. It's going to be a bit like lung cancer. You know how we made progress with ALK, and then also with EGFR mutations, and now in breast cancer with BRCA, and we're going to see increasingly that breast cancer is a set of small orphan diseases. Um, that is uh, the that is, I'm, I'm, I'm stating the conclusion at the front, that is now very clear when you look at, at the data that's presented from NGS from all over the world, that is what we are seeing. I heard a, a figure that of the 1,000 genomes that were sequenced with breast cancer, 30 percent of patients might have mutations that are observed in no other patients besides themselves. Going to be. You know, that's, that's, that's really challenging. This is one of the slides that shows this, right? This is a slide that shows um, some work by Foundation Medicine using, looking at the genomic alterations in 169 breast cancers, asking the question, which genes are commonly mutated? You can see two or three on the left have mutations commonly, p53, we've known about that for years, pi3 kinase. But notice then that long tail. Um, there are many genes that are mutated, but those genes are mutated in just a small percentage of the other patients. The other thing I will tell you, um, and this is the only time I'm now going to admit to you, I am now going to try to really get you depressed. And I'm going to do that by uh, referring to what we know from genetics. 
We know from genetics in cystic fibrosis, for example, that there are over a thousand mutations that can cause cystic fibrosis. And we now know, right, that there are different phenotypes of cystic fibrosis. And they need to be thought about differently and treated differently, right? There's a new personalized medicine treatment for 5% of CF patients, right, who have a particular kind of mutation. It means that for PI3 kinase, for example, or for any of these genes, it could well be that not all of the mutations are the same, and we might have to think about them differently. And so uh, this is going to mean, I think, and the conclusion is very clear, it's going to require us to create very large shared databases and to work together. And that is, you know, uh, one of the things is, I think that Israel can do and has done in the past is one of the reasons for us to be continuing to talk and to see as we are here and come back how we can continue to work together because it will require that kind of teamwork. So what does this feel like? I do want to show you some fun slides. I did depress you, so stop being depressed now. You know, they're, they're, you know this is not a new problem. There, there is a problem. Uh, we've had problems of lots of data um, uh, for many, many years. Uh, one story I like to tell, uh, in the beginning, uh, 10 years ago, I went and a, and a PhD scientist was talking about the technology and said to the audience, was giving this exciting talk, I can give you terabytes of information for your patient. And I laughed. I chuckled just like you were. Because first of all, I, even though I'm a geek and I'm a scientist, I forgot how much a terabyte was. But I knew that whatever it was, it was just too much, right? So, so what does a terabyte feel like? And so I, I pulled out some slides. One, it, it's like drinking from a fire hose. You know, it's just overwhelming. The, the other thing that a terabyte can feel like is, right, we sometimes feel like that, right? Yeah. Sometimes having too much data can stop us in our tracks. That's clearly too much data. And then the last one is, um, is a plot. One is on the x-axis, how much data you have. And the other, in some cases, you know, it's, you know, how much confusion occurs. So, I, this, you know, what I'd like to re uh, remember is when, you know, we first started our medical training, when we went to medical school or, or to school, we were taught to take a history. And yes, it turns out even in taking a history, you could get a terabyte of information of history. You could start out by saying, tell me your name, and then tell me your parents' names, your grandparents' names, where you went to school, where they went to school, what was the name of your first grade teacher. Um, you could collect a terabyte of history. But what did we learn in medical school? We learned it wasn't how many questions you asked, but it was whether you asked the right questions and whether you listened and knew how to interpret that. And that's going to be the story of next-gen sequencing and of genomics, too. And that's why it's going to be clinicians who know how to do that integration and make it practical for your individual patients that's going to be so important. Okay? It's not going to be a computer printout. So with that, you know, uh, let me tell you at least about some of the work that we're doing. And there's uh, you know, a lot of topics where, as I said, we're doing whole genome gene expression rather than just a couple of genes. We've started looking at gene fusions in breast cancer, like the ALK kind of abnormality or the temperous fusion in prostate cancer. And uh, we're also now looking at non-invasive testing, uh, looking uh, not just at the time of first diagnosis, but Genomic Health is very excited about now working with you also for advanced disease, uh, looking at the possibility of looking non-invasively at blood for the burden of disease, the specific sensitivity or resistance to drugs, and how that evolves, and having that be incorporated into treatment practice. I'm so excited about that. 
So just a couple of things. One with next-gen sequencing. I said we looked at the whole genome in one of our studies to look at genes that correlated with prognosis. Shown here is that we could rediscover, which was nice, the 21 oncotype DX genes. But notice we found over 13 other genes that were also associated with worse or better outcomes. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is now we're doing multiple studies to ask the question, could this help us develop an Oncotype DX, which is the next generation of Oncotype DX that might be a better in terms of prognosis or prediction? And so that's, you know, that will require, again, larger cohorts and much more data, but that's, again, one of the things that we believe is important. We're also, we did a, um, a collaboration with a company in, in Ireland called Almac, who has a signature for DNA repair damage deficiency. And we're looking to see whether that might help us predict which chemotherapy to use. Right now, the recurrent score generally predicts chemotherapy, but wouldn't it be interesting also to look at who needs a taxane versus who needs an anthracycline? And fusions, this is a, a really a, a fascinating result. Um, we actually had to modify and, and, and do some very sophisticated bioinformatics work to look at fusions, right? We have those 50 million fragments or sequences, and so the computer programs have to identify when do you see a sequence in one of those fragments that doesn't belong together, that seems to come from one part of the genome and another part of the genome, and they're fused together. Very uh, computational. And so in that analysis, what was found, we saw 100 fusions in 118 patients. Half of them predicted an in-frame chimeric protein, meaning that it, a new kind of protein might be made in that cancer cell. And we asked the simple question, I'm always, I always like asking simple questions first, was, well, are any of these fusions recurrent? Did we see any of these more than once? Or again, like mutations, were these all you know, different. And actually, we found three of them. Um, uh, we, we don't, uh, let me tell you right now, we don't know yet about the biology. But that's the work that we're currently looking at. But interestingly, there were eight cases of fusions that involved two genes that aren't very well studied in breast cancer. And so this may prove to be important. But very interestingly, I always love it when we see biology that we're familiar with. We saw a fusion of the estrogen receptor with another gene. Now, the estrogen receptor, right, could have been fused to any of 23,000 other genes in the human genome. It turned out that in all three cases, it was fused to a gene I never heard of, a gene called ACAP12. In fact, there's very little written about it. We continue, we, we need to still be so humble about what we know and what we don't know. And so now, you know, we're going to try to learn more about ACAP12. But I will tell you, I called up Matt Ellis, who works at Wash U, who's doing work on the Genome Atlas project. And I immediately asked Matt, did you find any estrogen receptor fusions? And Matt said, yes, at the time, he said, we found one. And then I said, was the partner ACAP12 and Matt said yes. So this is a, another now orphan type of breast cancer. We do not know. It could be associated with better outcomes. It could be associated with worse outcomes. This is just something we will have to study. And it's why we will need large data sets in order to be able to look at this with any frequency. Very interesting, right? And then the other thing, and I, I'm not going to show data on this because you're familiar with this, but there's very nice work, and, you know, and one of the you know, nice, very nice studies was done here in Israel looking at estrogen receptor mutations that exist in patients who've been treated with hormonal therapy that arise, that weren't present in the primary and then arise at the time of late stage disease. We do not know yet whether they are truly associated with resistance clinically. I know there's some suspicions that that's the case, but that's going to be a, 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 an incredibly important area to study. And I think it's going to re excite the area of investment 
in new drugs that will target the estrogen receptor in a more rational way. So, and then finally, as I said, we're looking at the blood for a non-invasive approach. The idea being that we now know that even in very early tumors and certainly throughout the course of the disease, either circulating tumor cells can be found or uh, DNA release from the cells that break up and die. And wouldn't it be great to study the biology in a, in a, in a recurrent and in an ongoing way in order to understand the evolution of cancer and how to treat it more rationally over time? So in summary, I think diagnostics clearly, I, have, I, I, I do not have a crystal ball and tell you what the, you know, what the next ALK what, what the next ALK is going to be next year, but I have no doubt that we're going to continue to see this progression of understanding these small subsets and therefore delivering better value to more and more patients. Uh, I only wish at the NCI in the United States and all over the world we would invest more now in the collaboration that's needed in order to work together um, uh, because you know, we finally have the tools and the concepts to test. I have no doubt, though, that we need then next generation sequencing, but also next generation health records. Um, and again, I know that's something that is, uh, is of a great need here as well, the ones that are not just useful for the payers, but the ones that also work and make it easier to enter data in clinical practice. That would be nice, and to make it easier actually to communicate to physician, uh, to patients, and to have a conversations with them and leave them with summaries. That would be nice. To make our jobs easier, it would be nice if they did those kinds of things. And also then collected the data that we could use for those large database studies. That would be very nice. And we need next generation regulatory. But I have no doubt that we will see a revolution. This is just the beginning of this revolution. And it wouldn't happen without people, your patience, your devotion to making genomics a reality uh, and doing it right. Thank you so much. We might uh, have time for a question or two. And it can be about uh, uh, any of these things or uh, even things that I didn't talk about. Um, one of the things I, you know, I, I didn't you know, talk a whole lot about the other tests. And I think one of the reasons is it's my understanding, actually, that, um, that you know, the, the use of uh, genomic tests is very much evidence-based here in Israel. Um, and again, you know, based on the evidence clearly with regard to, and boy, I see in the United States there are these new tests that are just coming out and people are talking about them all the time. But, you know, clearly using less than the best for early breast cancer, or early colon cancer, early prostate cancer, uh, you know, for such important decisions doesn't make tests make sense. But I get asked about this all the time and I think I'm getting better and I give a whole talk on you know, not getting into any test per se, but into that topic of what are the criteria. We're getting much better at talking about the level of evidence that's needed and the criteria, just as we have high criteria for the use of drugs in oncology now, you know, much better understanding of that than we did 30 years ago. Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. <laughs>